as in one, my name is Charla Henson. I'm at the Abilene uh, Museum of the 12th Armored Division, the opening weekend, and I'm with James S. Pilgrim. And he was in the 66th, uh, 66th Army Infantry Battalion, Company A. I appreciate you talking to us today. Uh, first of all, I want to know your complete, your full name, where you were born, and the date of your birth. I'm James S. Pilgrim. I was born uh, December 7th, 1924, at Grinnell, Iowa. And tell me about your family. Well, I grew up on a, on a farm with a brother and two sisters, and wanted to enlist in the Marines when I got through high school in 1942, but I have eye problems and they wouldn't take me. So I waited a year until Uncle Sam thought I was ready for the U.S. Army, and they, they did take me. Okay. Where did, where were you, uh, where did you start your basic training? I took basic training starting about July 4th, 1943 at Camp Fannin, Texas. Okay. Uh, tell me about that training. What was, what was it like? Was it what you expected? Yeah, I guess it was what I expected. It was very hot there in July. And in East Texas, it was humid. And Tyler, Texas is the rose capital of the world. So sometimes we were crawling out amongst the rows of rose bushes, and that was kind of a prickly job then. Was it, was it really a tough experience physically to be in basic training? Yes, it was. T tell me some about what, they, what you had to do. Well, of course, we crawled on our bellies under barbed wire entanglements with live machine gun fire going over us. And that was a little scary. <laughs> and we uh, practiced, fired 60 millimeter mortars and uh, 30 caliber machine guns and of course a lot of M1 rifle fire and basic infantry training. A lot of road marches. So you went from there, then did you come to Abilene Camp Barkley? No, I, uh, after I finished there and had a furlough, I was sent to uh, College Station, Texas at Texas A&M for the Army Specialized Training Program. How did you get in there? How, how, what was the process of getting into the ASTP? Well, you had to have a certain uh, level in the Army General Classification Test. And I had had a year of college while I was waiting to go in, and that probably helped me too. So what were you being trained for? Uh, engineering at Texas A&M. Is that what you wanted to do? Well, it wasn't what I planned for my life work, but that's what the Army wanted me to do. Okay. Um, tell me how that was. Uh, were you made up in companies or just classes? What kind of organization ha went on with the ASTP men? Well, we lived in... Uh, college dormitories there and we had companies and platoons and so on with student officers for them and of course a regular army uh, officer in charge of each company. So there were how many, were, were the companies, were they in a certain class together or were there several companies in one class? I'm afraid I don't know how that was set up, don't remember I guess. Do you remember any, any of uh, any of your professors or anything like that at a and &M? Couldn't tell you the name of one. Okay. That's been too long ago. Yeah. <laughs> tell me about the day that you found out the ASTP was being shut down. And how you well, felt we, about it. We were in a formation and the uh, Army Lieutenant uh, read the order to us that uh, it was going to be closed down and we'd go back to the uh, fighting troops. Was were you disappointed? Were you surprised? I guess I was surprised. I, I really didn't expect that. Uh, but it's when you're in the army, you do what you're told. <laughs> so how long did it take you to find out that the the uh, specialty training was closed until the time you were uh, sent to Barclay? Uh, a matter of a few weeks, I guess. 
Did you were you allowed to finish a semester or a quarter or something, or was it in the middle? Uh, it was in the middle of a semester. I think we finished a half semester, so I got some college credit for that later. Yeah. Are there any men of the twelfth that you remember being in school with at A and M? Any guys that ended up going through with you? I just talked to one of them out here, Russ Lowe from the 119th Engineer Battalion, and uh, the Loth Trims went in basic training with me and at ASTP, and they went to the 119th Engineers. And you went, did you go directly to the 66th when you got to Barclay? Uh, for a few days while we were waiting for assignment, I lived with a tank uh, company and then went to A66. What did you, what would you have liked to do? Well, what would have been your choice of, of all, all these choices at Barclay? Uh, well, we did not have a choice, of course, uh, but uh, the year I was waiting to be called up, I took field artillery ROTC at Iowa State University. So I thought I was qualified to get into that branch, but that wasn't where the Army sent me. <laughs> they needed more riflemen than they needed artillerymen. Uh, what was your reaction when you found out you were going to a rifle company? Oh, I, I guess disappointment that I didn't go to the field artillery. So do you feel like that you were, uh, that your training put you a little ahead of everybody else since you had had your, uh, the training that you're in college in Iowa? Well, I at least knew what left face and right face was. So I, I knew how to march, and I'd been in the trumpet and drum corps there in the field artillery ROTC, so uh, I think it gave me a bit of an edge. So you did your, your gun training, all your proficiency stuff down here at Barclay? Your gun, the rifle training and everything? Well, we did that again as advanced training. We, of course, had done it initially, and basic training at Camp Fannin, and then I don't know whether this is what you want to hear or not, but uh, uh, when we were waiting at Camp Shanks, New York to go overseas, I had such a good record as a rifleman that they sent me in several truckloads of uh, infantrymen to uh, the military academy at West Point to the rifle range there, and they gave us one-day tr sniper training school on the old 1903 rifle with a telescopic sight on it. So that was interesting. So were you a sniper? Were you considered a sniper? I had this one-day sniper training. Uh, after that, I never saw an 03 A A3 sniper rifle again. <laughs> but I think it did help me when I was using an M1 rifle, too. So you were on the M1 all the way through the war? Uh, part of the time I was a radio operator, and sometimes I carried either either a carbine instead of my M1, or sometimes just a captured P38 German pistol. But most of the time I carried my M1. That was my best friend. <laughs> did, did that best friend stay with you from the beginning to the end? Were you able to hold on to that same gun? Well, while we were... While we were overseas, I did, yeah. Not from basic training on, though. Yeah. Tell me what it was like to land in La Havre and to realize that we're, we're in Europe and here's the, here's the beginning of what we've been working on. Well, that beginning was kind of humorous. Uh, we got to La Havre on an LST, and the harbor had been bombed the night before, so it couldn't unload. So we anchored outside the harbor. And the Navy was feeding us two meals a day. It was dark. We were going in for our second meal, and we were up on the deck in a blackout, leaning against the railing. And I was talking to the guy next to me, and all of a sudden there were three splashes. He hit the water, his helmet hit the water, and his mess kit hit the water. Somebody had forgotten to fasten the chain across the opening uh, in, the, in the railing. And he fell in the water, and the Navy threw a, they broke, they broke the blackout for him and 
showing the spotlight on him. He was drifting out toward the channel. They threw a, a buoy out to him, and he grabbed that, and they dropped a ladder down and got a boat hook and hooked him and brought him up, took him down below to the sick bay, and then there was almost a mutiny on board because word got around that they'd given him a shot of whiskey. <laughs> Everybody threatened to jump overboard <laughs> to get a shot of whiskey. <laughs> so that was our humorous introduction to France. <laughs> yeah. uh, what it was like when you landed? What's what, that? What was, what was the area like when you landed? It was a mess. There were sunken ships and, and damaged uh, cranes and everything in the harbor. It, it was a real mess there. And then after we got off the ship, there were some uh, concrete emplacements there that guarded the harbor. We saw those. From the time you left La Havre until you saw your first action, um, how long was that? And what was your anticipation as you looked towards that? Well, it was a matter of weeks before they got some equipment together for us to to go into combat, and we took our half tracks across France to a town called Lundeville and stayed a few days there and then went up to the front lines. And I guess I wasn't really scared until I saw my first American dead soldier. And then I then I knew that we were in for it. <laughs> Was that and, one of the your was that one of your the fellow soldiers that you, or was that somebody else that had just? That was someone who had been killed prior to our takeover of that section. So that kind of made you real, kind of, this is the real thing? You bet. And before the day was over, we took uh, enemy mortar or artillery fire and had two casualties. And then, then we really knew that it was war. Tell me about the men in your company when you first got there. Well, I had trained with uh, almost all of them here at Camp Barkley, but in a company of 250 men, you don't get to know everybody well. I, mean, well. I meant uh, your uh, squad. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I was I was in a little different situation. I they called me a basic, and I I was in what they called a platoon headquarters section. There were three of us who served as Riflemen were needed, or uh, radio operators, or messengers for the platoon lieutenant. So I wasn't real close to to a squad while I was in combat. I rode with a squad, and I had trained with a squad in the, at Barclay here. Uh, two of whom were killed while we were overseas. Uh, two of them were supposed to be at this reunion. They didn't show up from Virginia. I'm disappointed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, tell me about the, uh, the the three of you, the radio, the rifleman, or the messenger. Well, uh, one radio operator was killed. Then, uh, on January 16th, when we attacked the Germans at uh, Steinwald Woods, our second radio operator took a bullet through the back. Uh, the lieutenant told me to get the radio, so I went over and put a wound patch on Abramson and told him to crawl back to the rail the rear that he had a million dollar wound. Turned out not to be that because he was killed on the way back but by mortar fire. Uh, but I took the radio then and, and carried it a good share of the time for the rest of the war. Sixty pounds on my back in addition to all my other gear. <laughs> when you, uh As y'all went towards, uh, was the biggest battle that y'all, your first battle, was that Hurlesheim for the 66, or was it the Stein? The Stein Steinwald Woods was where the okay, 66. Me, okay, tell me, uh, I have heard the story, but people who hear your, your story of what happened, tell me about the days before that and what got y'all in the Steinwald Forest and those kind of things. Well, our... We went into action on my 20th birthday, December 7th, 1944, and uh, had various minor battles. Uh, up until then, I froze my hands and feet one night in a slip trench, uh, and 
my platoon sergeant uh, woke me up and I managed to stumble back to the nearby town on my frozen feet and with my rifle crooked in my elbows. And he reached down and pulled me up on the last tank leaving town. Saved my life, <laughs> or I'd have froze to death. And then we had a few other minor skirmishes until January 16th when, when we attacked Steinwald Woods. And that's where we really got beat up. We lost probably 65% of our of the fighting men in our company that one day. What, what did you expect when you got to Steinwald Forest? What were the reports? Well, uh, the information that got down to the squad level was that it was held by only about 200 uh, overaged and underage troops and uh, one tank, I think, was the report. And we went up, uh, fixed bayonets, and the thing was called off on the 15th. We went up again on the 16th, fixed bayonets, went up in the dark. It was supposed to be a surprise attack then. And we were the ones that got surprised. Uh, the Germans opened up on us. We were in flat canal country. And they opened up with prepared machine gun positions and really slaughtered us. Did, did, we, did you ever find out what went wrong there? Was it bad? bad reconnaissance or mix up in messages or did anybody know? Oh, you hear all kinds of things in the Army, you know. My suspicion is that it was either either inadequate reconnaissance or uh, misinformation that the reconnaissance people had brought back. Maybe they didn't go up as far as they should have or I, I don't know. It's easy to place blame. but. <laughs> So, so they were really kind of entrenched in the in the forest. They were. They had uh, prepared positions there, plus apparently at least one anti-tank gun and one tank in there. And we got some tank support during the day, but uh, uh, lost one of those, and the others re retreated. And then mid-afternoon, Captain Day. Uh, called the artillery and uh, well he got permission to withdraw then he called the artillery and they put in a smoke barrage and those of us that were left then uh, retreated behind the smoke barrage. And a total of how many? About the total of how many survived that? Out of my company of, of the fighting men that went forward that morning I'd suspect there were 30 maybe 40 of us that walked back that night. What is, what is that like, coming back at night and losing so many from the day before? Well, it, it wasn't actually dark when we came back. It was an overcast day, so it was a gloomy day, but not actually dark. It was probably 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon when, when we pulled out of there. It was pretty sad. We had to leave one badly wounded guy up forward. Uh, the guys were just, he just slowed us down too much. The Germans were coming in on our right flank with a machine gun team, and they were throwing mortar shells at us. And Captain Day finally said, well, Sidney, we're going to have to leave you here. We'll send somebody back after you. Well, nobody got back after him because the Germans got to him first, took him back to their hospital where he later died. That was sad. Now, were y'all... Uh, were y'all involved in Hurlisheim or had y'all just been so torn up that you were back away from, from the front lines at that point? Well, the, the survivors were ordered to, about two days later, were ordered to go in and try and rescue the troops trapped in Hurlisheim. We started up on our half track, stopped, and somebody got orders to cancel the operation. We went back without casualties. And I guess the reason they stopped it was that all the people in Hurlisheim had been captured. What, how were you, how did y'all get replacements and all after that, after the? Oh, we, uh, they just came up from replacement depots uh, and about, uh, Two weeks later, I got a 48-hour combat pass to Paris. 
I didn't win any medals, but that was worth more than a medal. <laughs> Go back and sleep between clean sheets for two nights and take a warm bath and see the sights of Paris. That, that was one of the highlights of my combat experience. <laughs> yeah. Well, now then you became a radio man after, after the Stonewall Forest, right? Yeah. You told me that you had, you took on the duties of the radio man yeah. from that point on? Um, much of the time, yeah. Now, were you, uh, who were you in contact with between squads I, or units or what? I carried the platoon leader's mm -hmm. radio. He was a second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. I carried his radio and I communicated back with company headquarters okay. for orders. And and big part of my job was just telling them what was going on up on the front line. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your platoon leader, who he was and what he was like. Well, Paul Burson was platoon leader at Steinwald Woods. He came out of it without a scratch. Uh, this was when the this was when the black soldiers wanted to come up and volunteer, and they wanted some combat experienced lieutenants to train them. So he got called back for that duty. I got another uh, lieutenant who was uh, a battlefield commissioned from platoon sergeant. His name was Lieutenant Cap and I uh, served as his radio operator until a few days before the war ended. What kind of man was he? He was a excellent combat soldier, very courageous, uh, almost to a fault. Uh, he was always volunteering our half track for the point when we were going across Germany. And one day I said, Lieutenant Cap, you're gonna get us all killed volunteering for the point. He said, Pilgrim, you stay with me and you won't get hurt. He said, don't you realize that when the art German artillery is coming in, that it's landing behind the point, and the point doesn't get the artillery? Well, I hadn't thought of it that way. He was kind of right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, was he a very hard man, or was he just, by, by that time, it was sort of a common community? A hard man? Well, he was, I think he was born to be a soldier. Mm -hmm. uh, he was courageous. Seemed to have absolutely no fear. Uh, he had been to OCS twice and flunked out both times, but he got a battlefield commission, and that's just what that was just his proper place too. He was a frontline platoon leader and a damn good one. If <laughs> you pardon my French. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. How what was the reaction to replacement soldiers? I'd heard different things about sometimes you kind of try to keep your your distance from them because you know they're just going to get killed what was your experience with replacements well just that uh, of course they were very green until the end of the first day and then they were veterans uh, and they were just like the rest of us they were just as scared or just as courageous as we were uh, I had nothing but good to say about the replacements we had. Two of them died one day in a battle and uh, they were they were doing their duty, both of them. We had, we had good replacements in my half track. So you traveled mostly in the half tracks? Y'all were, were half trackers? Well after um, about when middle of February, uh, then we did a lot of our fighting from the half track. But sometimes we hit roadblocks or uh, so on, parked the half tracks, and we went in just like regular infantry. Okay, talk to talk me through in, then into uh, into Colmar. A uh, big part. Into Colmar from Hurlesheim on into Colmar. Yeah, after Hurlesheim, Steinwald Woods, and our next action was south of Colmar. My company did not take Colmar, but uh, we we went south of Colmar and uh, joined up with the French Moroccan troops coming up from the south. We were part of the French First Army at that time and transferred to them. Were, did, did they just give you orders? You They were sort of your command command post or... How, how did y'all, how, how did that happen? 
with the with the French army. Yeah. Well, at, at my level, uh, I don't know. Oh, okay. I, uh, they didn't the tell the squad that. people all these things. Oh, okay. But uh, General de Latre de Signy was a French army leader. And I'm assuming that he, uh, he cooperated with General Roderick Allen, our division commander, as to what we were to do. But it didn't make any difference down in the squads and the platoons, did it? No, nope. we were just fighting Germans. <laughs> What about uh, the mystery division? What do you remember that? Did you do you remember the day they came in and told you to get rid of all the insignias? Nothing special, just that we wondered why, of course, and weren't weren't told why, except that it was a security thing. Hmm. They didn't uh, they didn't tell us we were going up to be part of Patton's Third Army. They, we had to find that out later. <laughs> when did you find that out? I suppose the army rumors got around a day or two later. <laughs> when did the the label mystery division? When was that label put put on y'all as a label? Well, because because we took off our identification uh, for security reasons, the press was not allowed to report where we were, and so it became a mystery as to what had happened to the twelfth armored division wasn't in the Seventh Army anymore. Where was it? Well, we'd been assigned to General Patton to lead his drive from the Moselle to the Rhine. What was that like for an, an AIB, 66th AIB, to get orders to go? Well, uh, actually, we didn't, we didn't see a lot of combat in that. Uh, the recon and some of the other units uh, spearheaded that. We kind of stayed behind in reserve, so uh, we didn't get into really battle until we tried to take a bridge over the Rhine River. And the Germans had lowered their 88 ACAC guns that were guarding the bridge. When it was blown, then they leveled them down, and they picked off our first half-track and our 13th half-track, and the rest of them were sitting ducks up on a high road. And they picked them all off, killed a bunch of our soldiers, including my best friend that got up there. Who, who was that? My best friend, Robert Miner, Devil Lake, North Dakota. Were you with him there? No, he was in the 13 that got picked off. I was back about 14 or 15, uh, just just missed it. What, what was the sounds like that day? The what? Did you, what was the sounds like? What was, what was that? Did y'all know what was happening? Didn't, didn't know what was going on up there. We just knew that our column had stopped in close to the edge of this town. We got orders to outpost the town with our machine guns and so on. And the machine gun crews went up there. And I, I was listening on the radio, but I couldn't, couldn't understand what was going on. Uh, they didn't have time to use their radio. The, the first vehicle, the second vehicle was the company headquarters communications half-track, and that was the second one they picked off. So uh, I didn't hear hardly anything of what was going on. So how many men were killed? About 100 and something that day? Was Out of our right? company? I don't know that I ever saw the figures on that. Quite a few, including the platoon sergeant who'd saved my life by pulling me up on the tank. Mm -hmm. he, he was killed that day, too, and a lot of others that I knew. So the 66 went through two really, really hard things like that. Yep, yep, we had several very tough battles. Which ones stand out? Those two, are there any more? What's that? Those two stand out, are there, is there another one that? Well, a, a personal battle uh, later on over in Germany, uh, personal because it hit my squad so hard. Uh, we were point half track be behind a point tank. Uh, German Panzerfaust hit the tank uh, but didn't knock it out. Two of our squad were up on the top of the tank. Uh, one of them fell off, fatally wounded. Lieutenant Cap jumped out, although he took a, a wound in his chest at the time from the Panzerfaust, 
he jumped out, picked up the man, brought him around to the back of the half track to load him, and the tank can't see backwards. Uh, he knew he had been hit. He started backing up. We're loading the dying man on the back door. The tank ran over our left front wheel, put our half track out of action. <laughs> While this was happening, I was telling the company communications what was going on, and the, one of the machine gunners standing beside me uh, took a bullet through his forehead, and his assistant, uh, another rookie, uh, cradled him in his arms in his lap and left the machine gun unattended. So I dropped my handset, grabbed the machine gun, and I became a machine gunner. <laughs> and uh, so that was two dead right there. Uh, we went on and took the town on foot. Uh, had one wounded on the way in. The most, uh, part of the machine gun squad that was left set up outside the town. Germans started throwing mortars in made a direct hit on the foxhole. Didn't kill the two guys, but wounded them badly. And they came running back to the house I was in. And I patched them up, called for a medic half-track to come up and get them. So we had, what, two, three, four, five. We had five wounded and two dead out of that half-track in a one-day battle. That was a tough one. What was the closest? When did you feel that your person was in most danger? I mean, you've had, it sounds like you've had a lot of close calls. Oh, yeah. A lot of mortar fire, and at Hurlesheim Woods, or at uh, Steinwald Woods, every time I'd raise my head up, snap, a rifle bullet. Somebody had me zeroed in there uh, while I was waiting to crawl forward with the radio. Uh, so that was scary. Uh, I guess it was, most of it was scary, but at one point I, got to a point where I didn't care anymore, and I did lead a few men up towards Steinwald Woods. Uh, lost one killed, and got up to the front ditch with the captain, and he told us to stay there until we got orders to withdraw. So I, I guess I was just so tired and fed up that I didn't care. <laughs> I guess that's the way people get medals. <laughs> oh, did you get a medal for that? No, but I got the 48-hour pass to Paris. You got the pass to that, Paris, yeah. That, that beat any that medal. Beat yeah. <laughs> uh, what, um, you probably had as much fire around you as anybody I've talked to. How did you survive that? Was it, how did, how did, what did you, what about you helped you get through all that in one piece, body and mind? Well, I carried a prayer from my mother and my billfold all the way through, and and I did a lot of praying, and the man upstairs took care of me, or the woman, whoever's up there. You'll like that. <laughs> oh, I think he's a pretty good guy. <laughs> so so your faith is, is one thing that got you through your war experience. That's right. Yeah. And it's still carrying me on. Yeah. Yeah. As you look through... As you think about the men that you worked with, uh, who is the one that you respect and hold in highest esteem? Is there one person like that? Well, Captain Day, our company commander, was the best officer that I served under. But Lieutenant Cap was the most courageous one. And Sergeant Janda was my, would be my nomination for the best uh, best non-com. Tell me about him. Well, he was he was in charge of the hut out here at Barkley, where I stayed all the time out at Barkley, and he was a, a regular army cavalryman from Fort Riley, Kansas. And uh, uh, if you'll pardon me, the, his nickname by the guys in the squad was the shit kicker because he was a cavalryman, <laughs> had to clean out the stable. <laughs> But he was, he was a regular guy. He was a good sergeant. He was reasonably strict, but not overly strict. And he was, he was a good man until he got wounded soon after we got to France. He was from uh, some place in Kansas. Saw him twice after the war. What did you, uh, what did you learn about yourself in this war? 
Well, I learned I could take a lot more than I ever thought I could. But uh, no matter how tough it got, I was always able to take it. Came close one time, maybe, to not taking it. We were waiting on the main river near Swinefort. We were supposed to make a pinchers around Swinefort, take that city. And I'd been carrying a 60-pound radio for about three days with dead batteries. And I said to Lieutenant Cap, I said, I'm going to leave this radio on the bank here. I said, we haven't got batteries. Uh, where we're going, they're not going to get to us with any. Uh, that's the closest I came to giving up. I, I was fed up with carrying that 60-pound radio. Oh, no, Pilgrim, we may get batteries up there. You've got to take it with you. So we went up, we went up the high hill there but on the other side and took the woods and kept the radio. <laughs> Did you ever get batteries for that radio? Yeah, we got them after we got down off the, off the hill. <laughs> Batteries were hard to come by, and you couldn't just throw the heavy batteries away. You had to turn them in to get replacements. So that that perturbed me a good bit. <laughs> Did you ever have to run wire or anything? Uh, only after the war. I was in a communications oh. section for a while and did run a little bit of wire, but mine was mainly voice radio. What are some funny things that, that you remember happening? Were there any funny things or kind of, or was there anybody that kind of kept things loose, loosened up when things got really tough? Oh, outside of the incident on the LST, that was the funniest thing that happened. I still laugh about that. Talk about that with my Navy brother. <laughs> uh, I don't remember anything particularly funny. Uh, an interesting incident was that uh, on Hitler's birthday, he gave orders to his troops to kill an, an American officer uh, for a birthday present for him. So Lieutenant Cap, somewhere in his barracks bag, bag had his uh, green uniform, his dress uniform. And he and Lieutenant Pollock, who was the company executive officer, they dressed up in their, in their officer greens as you know, just saying, here we are, come and get us. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> and they made it through the They day? made it, yep. They both lived through the war. <laughs> oh, me. Oh, that's funny. Um, I want to know, um, what is the 12th Armored Division? Um, what is the camaraderie among you men done to help you... Uh, deal with the memories and stuff of the, that war? Well, when we, a lot of us don't like to talk much about combat with our families, but by coming to reunions, we can find someone else who has been through the same problems, and we can talk to them about it and get a little bit of it off our chest. Makes it a little more livable. So it's, it's a pretty good, uh, good catharsis for you? What's that? Kind of a catharsis, kind of oh. get it out and deal oh. with it. Oh, it's, it's no fun to be in a war and kill people, you know. And you, you get with your buddies, well, you can talk a little bit about that. They, they did the same thing and went through the same problems that you did. And, and uh, yeah, it's uh, like going to a psychologist, I guess, or a psychiatrist, maybe. <laughs> so is that, um, did you have problems after the war getting kind of being able to separate that? I know some people do and... Well, I told my family that it took three years for the Army to make a good killer out of me. And it took three years of civilian life to get me back in, in pre-Army condition again. And my wife told me I, I talked a lot in my sleep for the first few years of our marriage. But, so I guess it was bothering me some. War as hell, they say, and and uh, I went through it for five months. <laughs> yeah. Looking back um, over those months, is there one specific? Is there one specific thing that happened to you that just stays in your mind? 
that if you were to think about the war, that that's going to be the first thing that kind of comes to your mind? Yeah, I, I killed a German who was as close as you and I are here. Uh, and that, that stays with me. Most of the others were a ways off, you know, that I shot at. I don't know whether I killed him or wounded him or what. But this one, I put a bullet right in the middle of his forehead. Uh, I, could, I could have stuck him with a bayonet, but I didn't have a bayonet on my rifle. Unfortunately, I had ammunition. So that's, uh, that's the thing that stays with me. I'll never forget that. Did you, did you men feel, how did you feel about the Germans and the German population? Was there a well, separation or was it about the same? Well, of course we, uh, I don't know that I personally had any hatred for the German population. Uh, and for a while after the war, we were not allowed to uh, have anything to do with them. But later on, that was relaxed, and I became well acquainted with a German family in Swabish Gmund who spoke, some of the children spoke good English. And I communicated with them for 25 years before it finally stopped. Visited them once on a vacation. So I, I have no respect, of course, for the German hierarchy that, that started all the problems. But German people, I'm a little bit German myself, so I can't be too critical of them. <laughs> hey, tell me about the end of the war and what you did. What happened? What, how, did, how did you get back home, or were you going to go to Japan, or what? Well, we were down in the Alps Mountains, almost in sight of my grandmother's hometown in Switzerland, and I couldn't get over there. Uh, and we were told that uh, we were going back to the Army of Occupation. This was three or four days before the war ended. And we went back to a little town, and I took my shirt off and went out and laid in the sun and soaked up some sun and got a bottle of cherry wine and drank that. And I really relaxed for a couple of days. <laughs> and then uh, we were uh, in a town near Heidenheim for a month or so, and then I was transferred to the 1st Armored Division for occupation duty uh, at the division recruiting office, typing up disc charges and so on, counting the money out that they got paid. And I did not want to go to Japan. I'd had enough combat. And I was fortunate enough to stay in Germany for almost a year of occupation duty. At the end of that time, the recruiting lieutenant said, Pilgrim, you're about due to go back to the States. Uh, I want you to sign one of those enlistment papers and type it up for yourself. <laughs> I said, Sir, if you guarantee me the same job for the next three years in this same town, I'll think about it. <laughs> uh, Pilgrim, he says, you know, I can't do that. And I said, yeah, I know. That's why I'm going home. <laughs> what was it like those first few months in Germany? I know you couldn't, you couldn't really um, fraternize with the Germans and stuff. But overall, how do you, did, did American soldiers, when they put down their guns, could they kind of put away the, that feeling of enemy and stuff like that? Yeah, I... Uh, I don't think it took any time at all for me to be friendly with them, except we weren't supposed to be. I remember the little German kids coming up outside our hotel room, holding up their hands, and we'd throw candy bars or gum out to them. It's hard to resist little kids, you know. They they weren't responsible for the war. Were the, were the towns that you, after the war, were they pretty well torn up, or did they have general daily needs taken care of? Uh, the towns I were in uh, were all very limited damage from the war. I was fortunate that way. With one exception for a few weeks. I was at an airfield that had been badly bombed. The rest of the time while we were in towns where they had not been bombed badly, and this probably meant better relations with the civilians than 
if we had been on the badly palm town. Well, what did you do when you came back to the States? Did you go back to school or what? Well, thank heaven for the GI Bill. I went back to Iowa State and finished up there, got my degree. What did you get your degree in? Agricultural education. And then what did you do? Well, you that was training to be a teacher, but after practice teaching, I did not want to be a teacher. <laughs> So I went back to my hometown and worked for a man there that I'd worked for in a feed store in a hatchery uh, part-time in my younger days. And then I moved to Clinton, Iowa and worked in the same feed department there, which I was head for 32 years. Worked for the same man for all that time. <laughs> Um, before we quit, I want to, or is there some areas that I have not touched that I need to, that we need to talk about that's important? Or stories that you tell your family that you haven't told me? <laughs> well, I haven't told my family all of my stories. <laughs> uh, you've heard some of them probably that I've never told them. But my time's running out and uh, I better tell somebody now or they're lost forever. So well, that's why I was willing to volunteer to do this. As you think about this tape, maybe seen for two or three generations, unless the Lord comes back, um, this may be around a while, and they're going to pull this out maybe in five, ten years and listen to it. What would be the message that you would like to leave with the people that listen to you in years to come about your war, what, how you felt about it, maybe some good advice, things like that? Well, I think the main thing I'd tell future generations is to be very thankful to the guys with the gold stars out here in the Freedom Walk. Uh, they're the ones that made it possible for us to live this last 50 years in freedom and peace. Well, it's a limited peace anyway. Uh, good, good economic time. And just, just be thankful to those men. They're the ones that made it possible. And of course, those of us that came back did, did some share of it too, but we, we came back. They did not. Their, their families mourned them, and uh, their families are to be thought of too. Well, I appreciate you zipping in here and letting me do this at the last minute. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, that was a happy coincidence. Oh, yeah, it was. Thank you. <laughs>